Howdy, folks. Uh, this is Peter Bowman, and uh, this is a new show we're doing. Um, te tentatively titled Three Men in an Anime, because what the hell, why not? Um, I, I think we'll. I'm joined by uh, my friend, my friends, Eric Carlson. Hey, Eric, how you doing? Hello. And uh, Sonic uh, Gav Leaf, otherwise known as Sonic Gav. How you doing, Gav? Hello, peoples. All right. So this all started uh, when. I decided I, I came up with an idea of doing. I, I'd heard people talk about doing things like this, similar similar things like this. But uh, I decided that uh, I've been trying to get various friends of mine to watch various anime that I've watched and enjoyed, and sort of want to spread them around. And I, it occurred to me that you know, both like Gav, yes, um, right, <laughs> both <laughs> both <laughs> spread through the internet. <laughs> both Gav and Eric like anime. And I figured that, you know, we could, it'd be fun to sort of get together on a Skype call together and, you know, watch anime to get, look together online and be f kind of fun. And we started off with uh, Yamato 2199, which is one of my favorite series of all time, if not probably my favorite series of all time, honestly. Uh, and then this past weekend, Gav sort of suggested that maybe we should do a little sort of recap show after we finish the series and talk about our impressions of the show, what we thought of it. And so on and so forth. Uh, and I thought that was actually a pretty cool idea. And I read it by Eric and Ga and Eric seemed game. It's also why this show will never yes. be regular. Oh, this oh. show will. <laughs> yeah, no. this show is going to be sporadic at best, as yes. you know. We we watch the shows when we have time. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, we finished uh, twenty one ninety nine a little wh wh while ago, so we're going to do that. We're going to talk about that one first. We have another series we've got we've already finished also, which we'll do later. I'm not sure. I'm not going to say what it is yet. Uh, I will actually reveal what the sh what the next show will talk about. It will be at the end of the show, um, and uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to be talking about Yamato twenty one ninety nine this week, uh, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about the history of the show before I we go too far, before we get into talking about the show itself. Mm. Uh, Yamato twenty one ninety nine is is te the full title is Uchu Senkan uh, Yamato twenty one ninety nine or Space Battleship Yamato twenty one ninety nine translated. Uh, it is a remake that was made in 2012 of the classic uh, anime series Uchu Senkan Yamato, which came out in 1974 uh, and was made Jeez, by... A the... thousand years ago. <laughs> yes. It is only barely younger than I am. <laughs> well, sorry, barely older than I am. It, no, younger than I am. I'm, I, yeah. I, Maths. Yes. <laughs> Stupid linear time always confusing us. Right. Anyways, it was made by it. It, it was created by the legendary Leiji Matsumoto, uh, who is not technically involved in the remake, but uh, one of his partners his who fingerprints all the fuck over it. Uh, yes, and one of his partners. Um, <laughs> crap. What's his name? Hang on. Uh, I'm going to guess some guy with an Asian sounding. Uh, Yoshinobu Nishizaki. Uh. <laughs> I forgot I the guy's... have wiki. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but it was one of the people who worked on Yamato. Was largely involved. The original Yamato was largely involved in the starship design. Was largely involved in this show also. Um, and it is one of those occasions where they've actually done a remake and done it right. Yeah, the fidelity to the original in this is astounding. Uh, I, let me just say that, like. It looks like a 70s anime remade with modern techniques and, you know, sense of pacing and character development and shit. Yeah. Like, holy crap, does this look like... The, the, the character designs, the ship designs, all of that, all are just, like, straight out of, of the the original... Um, and the, the original Space Battleship Yamato or Star Blazers, if you're American. And, yeah, like... I was I was impressed with the degree of fidelity to the original designs that they right. that were involved here. But before we start talking about the show, also there's one other thing I want to do, which is uh, just sort of to let people know where each of us are coming from when it comes to talking about anime. Ah, yes. Because uh, we we do have somewhat I think we all have somewhat different sort of introductions to anime and sort of what we look for a little bit is a little bit different. Um, and we'll get to that. So why don't we start, Eric? Why don't you start off with uh, with all of this? Okay, well, you guys have probably heard this story before, our, our regular listeners anyway. But um, I more or less got started in anime in grade school with the simultaneously maligned and beloved Robotech. Everyone either loves or hates that show. 
I love it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and, and just the uh, freaking adored the, the, the show growing up and um, sort of spent the next couple decades as sort of this, like, hungrily snapping up anything that looked similar, not that I was aware it was actually came from Japan at the time, <laughs> um, <laughs> from, from video stores and, and rental places. Yes, those were a thing once upon a time. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And um, basically what... I, I'm an animation junkie. I really don't care where the... That the show was made, and as long as it's well animated, and I had Japan just puts out some of the most beautiful work, like, like, um, like, and consistently. Sometimes they put out a lot of ass too, but yeah, <laughs> some of the the most beautiful animation I've ever seen comes out of Japan, and um, because Japanese are crazy, I guess I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I really look for that, and I really enjoy a good. I like characters and stories and an inability to service either one of those puts me off. So, yeah. Right. It's got to be pretty. Got to have good characters and a decent story. Right. Gav? Roughly about that order. I will watch this <laughs> about anything if it's well, well animated. <laughs> Fair point. All right, Gav. Well, as you, as you may tell from the accent, uh, I come from the land of Brit. Um, <laughs> if oh, anyone... Yeah. If anyone in the U.S. thinks that you find anime difficult to come by, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's to the point where in in the in the nineties uh, when I was in my teens, um, you know I'd, I'd I'd watch the cartoons. Um, you know things like Pokemon were just starting to become big, so we were starting to see that Japanese animation again. Um, but then I started catching these other cartoons, cartoons with violence and adult themes, and I wanted more of this. And the the animation style reminded me of the cartoons I used to watch in the in the eighties. Because um, for those that don't know, a lot of the big uh, American um, studios sourced a lot of their stuff out to Japan. Mm, so right. um, Sunrise, for example, was huge in the eighties. Um, shows like Jason the Wheeled Warriors was mostly produced by Sunrise. Ah, that was a show that gave absolutely zero fucks about anything. <laughs> exactly. But the the anim you know the, the animation style when it was you know good at least the intro, um, the vehicle design, all that sort of stuff. It was all you know it was it was that same style that I was seeing again. And then all of a sudden, the Sci Fi Channel decided there might be a market here on a Wednesday night at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> and that typically ran, <clears throat> typically ran uh, two shows of a series, uh, which was generally the three series they they hired they they rented out, uh, which I'm sure a couple of them at least will get to eventually, uh, which were Blue Gender. Um, oh, I hate that show. Yeah, uh, Evangelion, uh, Martian <sighs> Success and Nadeshiko and then a, a couple of others that threw that were around, followed by Movie of the Week, which generally skipped around between Perfect Blue, Pat Labor, um, Ghost in the Shell, and for some fucking unknown reason, Urotsuka Doji, Legend of the Overfeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> I mean, to be fair, it came on at 1am, so okay, but whatever. Yeah, it was after the watershed, so I, I, I guess you're... Bit. Oh lordy! <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, and then for some reason, um, around about the time when I was just about to hit college and that kind of thing, they just stopped. Um, and then Toonami started up uh, over uh, here, yes. and, and I and then and then mm. I started catching on to things like Gundam Wing, um, uh, oh, uh, Outlaw Star, Cowboy Bebop, right, and. I was going around every DVD store and, and shop looking for this stuff, and there was nothing there until I started taking the plunge and just buying these randoms. It's like it's it's from Japan, okay? It's 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 anime, whatever. You're charging like next to nothing for it because you you think it's for kids, 
It's on the bottom shelf in the children's section. That really shouldn't be there. <laughs> I'll have it. <laughs> <laughs> the UK has, has, has absolutely no respect for what they were other than they were cartoons. Right. And because of that, it was just so hard to get hold of. And this is why I'm loving this idea because, yeah, okay, if you talk to me about Evangelion or, you know, the big stuff, I'll know it. But when my friends are all making these comments, like, Peter, you've been doing it for years with this show. And, right. <laughs> and others. And I'm just like, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'm loving this idea of just being able to catch up and see what other people think and just, just, just poke around and see what's there. Right. All right. And uh, much like Eric, I got into anime when I was pretty young and stumbled across a show on television. Uh, I... I'm I'm a bit older than Eric, so uh, this was in the late 70s. Uh, <laughs> and uh, interestingly, it was Star Blazers, a, a.k.a. Space Battleship Yamato, brought over to the States. Uh, and I, I, I grew up loving cartoons, but, you know, a lot of the cartoons in the States during the late 70s, early 80s were um, crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's watching them but yeah there's a lot of like a lot of syndicated uh uh syndicated Hanna Barbera stuff that was just oh oh the pain like honestly Scooby Doo was probably the best of the bunch and that yeah Scooby I remember I remember Scooby not not in that era but a little bit later on it was nothing but reruns well, I mean, that's the thing. It was syndicated, yeah. so, I mean... Oh, yeah. Yeah, Scooby-Doo... Saying Scooby-Doo is the best is damning with the faintest of praise. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it just, you know, repetitive background it, backgrounds, is they, you, and the animation was always lazy, and, I mean, sometimes the art was not terrible. Like, Scooby-Doo's art's not terrible, for the most part. Like, the designs and such, but it's just not well animated. And, and then I stumbled across, one morning, this show with spaceships and blowing each other up and this unbelievably epic plot because, you know, there's less than a year to save Earth and I'm still going, what? what? What's what's going on? What? <laughs> and I was hooked. I mean, th you're talking to the guy who, like, one of my formative uh, sort of movie... My, 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 for my f actual formative movie experience was the original Star, was Star Wars when it came out in 77. Yep. So... This comes out, and I'm like, ooh. And yeah, Star Blazers has some questionable dubbing uh, and some changes <laughs> that don't help things. Some things that actually improve the show, in my opinion. But it was just so much better than anything else I was watching. And I, I, at, I was young, so I didn't really figure out exactly what it was. Looking back at it now, it's just that it's got a much... It, the, original, it, the original show had a much... It was, you know, it was, it was not episodic. It was serial. So, you know, there's an mm. ongoing story. There was actual character development. There was actual drama and tension and s real stakes. And it and was... It talked down to you. Right. That too. And it was like... Which it was, is a big part of why I fell in love with Robotech growing up. Right. And I, much, not much later than that, I mean, a couple of years later, Robotech started showing and Manzinger and, you know... Although it was called Transor Z here. Uh, Transor Z. I mean, you know, Guy King and uh, Grandizer and Gal Guy Gar, although I think it was called the Starvengers here because. Um, oh, and Battle for the Planets, otherwise known as uh, Science Ninja Team Gachaman. Um, and uh, that had um, some more significant changes than almost any of those other ones made. I did for... not like that show. <laughs> I, I I didn't like it much either. Although I, I liked the big spaceship that turned into a phoenix. That was kind of yeah, cool. See, yeah. we only we only started getting that over here when Power Rangers got big. Yeah, because I can see that. It makes perfect the sense. Just grabbed anything that looked Sentai. Well, it, it, it is a, it is a Sentai show. It's just a oh, sci-fi yeah. Sentai show. Yeah. Um, and the original Gatchamon's actually a good show. I've now I've I haven't gone back and watched it. It's dated as fuck now. Like more so than Yamato. Yamato stands up better than than Gatchamon does, in my opinion. I, the, I'll admit I didn't even realize that was a uh, a Japanese um, show crossover until the Tatsunoku versus Capcom games started coming out. Right. <laughs> uh, I didn't even realize. Well, the uh, the really funny thing is the version that was done in the states. Um, I forget the company that brought it over, uh, but they decided to, for some bizarre reason, 
add in a whole add in another character to the show. This little annoying robot called Seven Zark Seven, who oh, coincidentally okay. looks a little bit like R two D two for some reason or yeah. another. I have no idea why they would do that. Um, not that R two D two was popular, because oh my god, R two D two was popular. <laughs> um, because everything Star Wars was popular at this time. So like, ooh, we'll inject a robot here who can like communicate with them and be relatable to the kids. God, I hated Seven Zark Seven. I hated Seven Zark Seven so much. There's a child in the cast, but no, let's be relatable to the robot. Oh my god, Seven Zark Seven was just... Oh my god. It's like Snarf. Nobody likes Snarf. Oh! oh. Everybody hated Snarf. Oh. See, this is the thing. There's nothing good came out of the 80s in regards to those, those, those cartoons, that era, except the opening intros. I don't know. Transformers has uh, had a lot to go say go for it, and there are parts of GI Joe. Maybe, but you can tell it's like uh, going back to where I mentioned Jason the Wheel Warriors. Yeah. I went back and watched that. I killed my childhood. <laughs> 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 the introduction and the video and everything about it, it the, the actually coming on, is awesome. The show is crap. Oh, it's yeah. like flash animation. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I've gone back and tried to watch some of the anime I watched in that era, like uh, like what I was like talking about, like Gal Gai Gar. Mm. Oh, oh, that does not stand up the test of time. No, <laughs> Guy King does kinda uh, does fairly well, and Manzinger stands up pretty well too. And Robotech, I actually still love, and the show it was based on uh, because it meshes together about what two or three different three, animes. Three shows: uh, Macross. Uh, Southern Cross and Genesis, Genesis Climbers, something weird. Mospita, I want to say. Mospita, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> so yeah, the one in the middle sucks, but you've got Macross and Mospita there, and those are both good. Also, yeah. They, they kind of had their own style, that even if it was dated, it's like... It, it's like watching a TV show from the past. It's like You know it's from a different era, but you forgive its fa its its failings because you knew it was the technology at the time. Right. Exactly, yes. And, I mean, I, I will say this about, uh, I mean, Macross is very good, and Muspita is solid. I'm not as big a fan of Muspita as I am of Macross. But I, I, have, I think it's because I grew up watching it that I've got a very sort of soft spot in my heart for, for Robotech. Although, mm. it, it's not Yamato for me, because uh, Yamato was literally my first anime, and you never forget your first time. Right. Well, <laughs> there's also the fact that, honestly, it's because it is it's oh, it is literally this one. It's one show, not three series smooshed together. Right. And I respect the living crap of the job those guys did doing that for Robotech. Yes, because well, yeah. um, it was it was quite the job. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm amazed they did it. Did as well as they did, honestly. But. We are, but we, I, I... We're going to talk about yet another show. Right. We're going to be talking about specifically Yamato 2199 this week. Um, because, uh, as I said, that's the first one we started with. Um, and, uh, well, it's, uh, as I said, it's become probably my favorite anime series. Uh, largely because the original Yamato is, has always sort of topped my list of favorite anime just because, A, it was my the first series I watched, B, I love. I'm a big sci-fi nut, and C, it's it's really good. It's spaceships blowing the fuck out of each other. Yeah, and it's it's a good it's a great story. Um, Yamato twenty one ninety nine takes the exact same story, uh, most of the same characters, adds a couple of new ones, which mo almost all the ones they add are big helps and great additions. And yeah, yeah modern Yamato is fucking boss. And He's great. And modernizes <laughs> it. Yeah. From 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 somebody who never watched the original, I didn't feel like you know when you, they, when they modernize something, they just jam a new character in. Yeah, yeah. And you can tell that character for being forced into something. From somebody who's never watched the original, I didn't know the differences. Then I, no, nothing seemed forced. Right. Oh, it's not. It's not. It's entire. Yeah, it was. It was clearly a labor of love, and it shows through. Right, but the other thing is, it's it's very clear that they all the new new characters they added. They added, they, they wove into the story properly. They all have a yeah. purpose and a reason to be there. And I really appreciate that. Um, so, uh, 
I guess we should, I, before we get too far, we should probably talk about what Yamato 2199 is about. That always helps. Yeah, that helps. Show me show, show the plot. So uh, it has a plot, it has a story. Um, it's pretty straightforward, honestly. The basic story. Uh, Space war, humanity loses, radiation bomb, Earth. <laughs> yeah, basically, there's a, basically, Earth encounters this alien race, the Gamelons, or Gamelos, I I'm going to call them Gamelons because that's what I've always called them because of, because of yeah, well, the Star Blazers. Uh, it's just refer to the, the, the home world as Gamelons. I, they, they refer to themselves as Gamelons, don't they? Uh, sort of. So. But anyway, so the Gamelons, the Earth and the Gamelons meet. For some reason, a war starts. That's explained during the show. Uh, it's actually a pretty, pretty good revelation. Yeah. Well, yeah. Th- it's... And it actually makes a, a sad amount of sense. Yeah. Uh, and... Earth gets their ass kicked because the Gamelons badly out-tech them, but won't give in, and so the Gamelons start radiation bombing Earth. Uh, and so Earth is dying, uh, and a friendly alien from a long distance away, several hundred thousand light years away, uh, sends a message to Earth with the instructions to build this thing called a wave motion engine, which will allow Earth allow uh, a ship to travel. Basically, to to use warp drive and uh, jump drives and you know yeah. travel faster than the speed of light over long distances very quickly, and they have a device that is called the Cosmo DNA Reverser. I think is the actual. Um, yeah, I think so. The yeah, Co- Cosmo Reverse. The, the Cosmo is something Reverser. Yeah. Yeah, um, and so to come to the planet Iskandar. Super seventies uh, name. <laughs> it was originally the Cosmo DNA device, but they they changed right. it to make it a little bit less silly sounding. Not much, though. <laughs> um, so basically, they have to come to Iskandar, pick the device up, and bring it back. Uh, and so they build a big, uh, build a space battleship, uh, load up a crew onto it, and set off on their ver- journey, uh, fighting the Gamelons along the way, get to Iskandar, get the device, come home, and save the Earth. That's yep. the basic plot. Yeah. Now, you know, the... Right, and so the... the uh, they build this, this space battleship, and it looks coincidentally a lot like the Japanese battleship from World War II, the Yamato, which is what they name it. Um, there because is ra- shut up. <laughs> be, and, you know, there's you know radiation bombing of Earth, a World War II Japanese battleship to save Earth. Um, there are no no allegories to World War II here whatsoever. No, <laughs> in shape or form. The Gamma oh, no. all blue skinned and blonde haired. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and. Um, they have a very, they have definitively have a very um, Prussian feel to them. I, I guess you could say. Mm. Yeah. Right down, right down to the SS badges on the collars. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, the Gamelons sort of are this weird sort of combination of, uh, actually not that weird thinking about it, of the Nazis and ancient Rome. Yeah. They, they, they're sort of. Politically, they have this sort of, you know, they, they're they're building a giant empire. And when they run into you know new 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 species new 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 aliens, uh, basically if they surrender they can join the empire as second class citizens and maybe earn their way up to first class citizens. This is totally the or and if they don't they get crushed and destroyed. This is how Rome operated. Yep. <laughs> that is literally what Rome did. <laughs> if you really well, pissed them the off. Empire, her your rose, who's your. Uh... Education. Here's their infrastructure. Here's your new uh, agricultural tech. What do you mean you don't want this shit? Well, now we're just gonna have to break everything. <laughs> right, and you know if you really fight back, they you know Rome does what they did to Carthage, which is you know and they you know sow the seals with salt in the end, um, and stuff still doesn't grow there to this day. Um, and there's no there there totally isn't a moment where the Gamelons do that. Oh, there is. Mm. <laughs> <clears throat> but this is, of course, measured to, to make the Gamelons actually bad guys, or at least a good chunk of the leadership bad guys, of a lot of Nazi tendencies. Yes. A lot of sort of sense of racial superiority. Um, uh, the design of, of the uniforms just screams... Um, yeah. Uh, 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 not Screams fascist. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all jack boots and high collars. Yeah. Yep. Um, one of the guys on the High Council is every smarmy, arrogant little SS officer in every World War II movie you've ever seen. Yep. <laughs> um, surprisingly long time to figure that out, honestly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, 
But, you know, so they, of course, make it a battleship because they got to protect themselves. And the people on Earth sort of, you know, one of their engineers looks at this, the the wave motion engine, which put, basically generates an insane amount of energy out of basically nowhere once it's started. <coughs> and realizes, well, this huge energy output, you know, it, we use it to propel ourselves along really far and really fast. What if I, ba what if we basically, you know, build a chamber in the front of the thing, channel the energy up there instead of running the engines and build up a giant energy blast as a last-ditch weapon. Because that's the human way of thinking. That this puts out a lot of, a lot of power. Really awesome. How can we weaponize it? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's it's very similar to sort of um, uh, in the uh, the known space uh, short stories by Larry Niven. Uh, Earth basically the first contact with the Kazin um, is. Oh yes. The the is an Earth ship stumbles across and Earth at this point is basically removed basically intentionally div defend di di divest themselves of all weaponry and such, um, d and through various ways and so the ship has no guns it's got a powerful fusion drive that allows it to travel through space at high speed and a powerful you know and a communication laser, and the captain basically out of desperation realized you know basically realized that you know. The engine could be used to be, he des in desperation uses the engine and the communication laser as improvised weapons to save himself. And so it's specifically the engine thing, you know, it's a power, it, it's right. not an efficient engine at driving you through space. It, sh it shoots out a whole lot of waste energy out the back. Mm. Wait a minute. That waste energy can do damage. <laughs> and as we see, it's a lot of damage. <laughs> yeah, in the uh, case of, yeah, the. It's a big gun. The wave motion gun, um, the original Yamato was the is is series. The wave motion gun was there, and uh, again, not surprising. And it's the first sort of example of the super doom um, hero cannon on on in, for any series, your know, hero weapon. Yeah. Like a lot of anime series involving spaceships or mecha, like su the super robot series, they have their super final weapon that they use to win the fight. So you've got the wave motion gun from Yamato. You've got the reflex cannon from Macross. Uh, blazing sword from Zo from. Um... I'm blanking on the name of the show. All of a sudden, Voltron. Voltron. Thank you. Um, and all this stuff. Uh, the reflex cannon on the SDF one. I, I mentioned that. Oh, did you? Yeah, I said Macross. Uh, clearly, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I, I'm. I'm yeah. <laughs> there, oh, a lot of shows have have these things. Yamato. They actually have a. Re they don't use it very often. They in in the remake they use it. I, I counted five times. Yeah. In yeah. the entire twenty six episode series. Yeah, that's one thing I, I did enjoy actually, because a lot of series it's like we're in trouble. Fire the main cannon. Right. So and, but my problem is, is with a lot of series is that here's the fight of the week. Use everything. Have it not work, and then use the main gun. Yeah. With Yamato, in Yamato, it's like, okay, let's do everything but use the main gun and make sure that works because the main gun is terrifying. <laughs> Everyone is scared of the main gun, including the guy shooting it. Right. The main well, gun... Except the one guy. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> except for the one guy who's like, this is the best thing ever. Let's use it all the time. Yeah. Well, one thing you're gonna I learn, if... I'd be wanting to do it too. <laughs> I, w I will say one thing you're going to learn about me uh, as this progresses. I am terrible with names yeah normally i'm terrible with names these are japanese names yeah i i i i, I have a wikipedia page up so uh yeah me too uh, i'm still not sure i I, don't, <laughs> I i remember i remember most of the main character names but anyway so uh but the problem with the way the reason they don't use there are two reasons they don't use the wave motion gun one is it is monumentally destructive to the point that like if we accidentally hit a planet it will pr might, might destroy it and we don't want to do that all the time. This is this is a weapon of mass destruction, and oh my god, we had no idea how powerful it was going to be. Yeah, the the original they actually weapon test it in live combat, and right. every single one of us like do so beforehand. Holy fuck! They basically <laughs> they they fired at a at a at a Gamelon outpost based uh, near Jupiter, intending to blow up the base. And it's on this sort of flo artificial floating continent. And it completely vaporizes the continent. They're like, ah! That was not what we intended to do. do. There's one other... <laughs> the other problem with the gun is that they have to basically shut down the ship to fire it. 
Because they basically have to channel all the the output of the engine into the pre-fire chamber for like 10 seconds. Yeah. This is an actual drawback to using the gun. The ship can't use its its, its, its energy shields when it's doing this. It can't change... It can't really maneuver much beyond maneuver thrusters. So it can pivot about a bit, but it really can't like fly and turn and dodge. They can't fire their main energy guns. They probably could fire the, the, the solid shells, I'm guessing. But that never really comes up. But they're sitting duck for 10 seconds. Yeah. That's a terrible thing to to, to use yeah, in the heat of battle. Yeah, 10 seconds is an eternity in a, ba- in a firefight. Right. So there are times they, they, they end up using it in battle, I think, a sum total of once in, like, an actual battle. Most of the time they use it as you know, sort of last resort type. It, it, at any rate... It, yeah. They actually have a good reason not to use it all the time, which I adore. Majority of the time, they use it as um, MacGuffin science device. Yeah, well, it's it's it, 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 for the most part, it, they use it five times total, um, and at least three of four of those times, I think they use it five times, and on four of those occasions, they are not shooting at a ship. Yeah, they are shooting at a base slash stellar object. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, like I said, one of the things I like about it is that everyone's terrified of this gun, uh, uh, and when it fires, to the point where the Gamelons don't even acknowledge it exists most of the time. Um, and, and like when it does get fired, like one of them goes, "Did they? Did they weaponize their engines? Are they? Are they mad?" <laughs> yeah, because the, the, in 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 um, context, the Gamelons. Uh, not only just dress like the Nazis, they are monumentally arrogant. Oh yeah. Oh so, oh yeah. Uh, the silly the silly monkeys from Terror could not possibly do anything at all to possibly promote you know be useful or competent or dangerous. Or be a th- they, they, they they're not a threat. They're not actually no. a threat as far as they're concerned. They're a distraction <laughs> and annoying. Three fleets later, no, still not a threat. <laughs> you know, <coughs> yeah, it, it, racial um one of the, one of the racial benefits for gamelons is plus twenty to your arrogance rolls. <laughs> well, the this thing is, is a, this is also a, de- a deficit for the gamelon race. Yeah, I, the thing is, is that the, uh, they show they they the the show starts with a fleet battle between the last some, basically the last Earth fleet and the gamelons out out near Pluto. And it's happening be- mostly to basically create a distraction so the Iskand- Iskandarians can get a ship through with the, co- the core of the wave motion engine. Um, because they got to slip it by the Gamelons without the Gamelons noticing. And the fight goes monumentally badly for Earth. Yeah. <laughs> to the point... They managed to cap one ship. They, they, they get a few ships here and there. Um, but, like, their opening salvo basically goes ping. Yeah, off the gamelons. Off the, the 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 hull armor of the gamelons. Now they're they're shield. I think it's their shielding, but yeah, yeah, because it was energy yeah. weapons. Right. The yeah, basically it, it, the Earth's it, energy weapons really have trouble hurting gamelon ships. Their missiles actually do stuff, but still yeah. takes a lot of missiles. Yeah, yeah. So Earth basically loses all but one one ship in that battle. Um, <laughs> well, technically two ships. One that the two ships could have made up, but the second one basically plays rear guard and sacrifice self to make sure that the flagship gets out alive yeah. with its cat with the with the admiral uh, admiral admiral, admiral okita. okita who was fucking awesome yep <laughs> admiral has the best bit, most stylish guy in the show like the gamelons might have the benefit of, of fascist fa- um fashion sense but okita's wearing the great coat and he's got the peaked cap with the goggles he's just he's rocking it <laughs> yeah so yeah captain juzo okita is one of my favorite characters in anime period uh, <laughs> he is every bit the old salt sailor uh, yeah and he's sort of the wise old man of the ship and he's fucking brilliant and he holds the ship together like like he is like adored by his crew like even when they're grumbling about him like yeah the old man is a jerk or He's punishing me for yeah. stupid. Armor. But they're like, they, there's this, still this core of, yeah, but it's Okita. He's he's like he's one of the only people we in the entirety of Earth AV who's had any success against the Gamelons, and he's, and every time he comes up with a plan, it fucking works. 
It's not to yeah. say that he doesn't have his naysayers, but they are universally all dicks. Yeah. Yeah. He he he's 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 one of those guys where he'll come up with a plan that he knows exactly what he's doing, and his chief of staff will be turning the his entire bridge crew will turn around, and he's literally like, like "Did I fucking stutter?" <laughs> they look at him like, "What? Are, are, did you just order us to do that?" Yes. Did I stutter? It's like, it, it, guys, right? Did I stutter? Gentlemen, like, orders. Go. Do them now. Yeah. <laughs> and then when it and and when it happens, you know, when it comes out and they come out the other end, it's like, "Yep, next quit. Next oh, one, you fuckers works. questions me, you're out of the fucking airlock." <laughs> except, he, except he wouldn't do that. He just thrown the no. break for about a, for about a week, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. He'd probably just give them, like, a glare and go, I'm very disappointed in you. It'd be <laughs> devastating than anything else. <laughs> yeah, I... Yes. Be the officer Okita thinks you should be. I mean... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're not being the officer Okita thinks you should be. Oh, I suck. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... Yeah, it's, we uh, there. We should talk a bit about the characters. And we're, we're talking about Okita, and he is... He's sort of the he's the heart and soul of the crew in a large. He's he's like you know he. I mean, he's not the main character of the show. I mean, it's an ensemble cast for the most part, but there's very clearly a couple of very sort of like main characters, and Okita's not really the main character. No, he's um. It's easy to see why he'd be your favorite, mm -hmm. <laughs> because he's awesome, but um. He's also very much a part of the, uh, like, up, held apart from the crew. Yes, because he's a captain. Um, yeah, and, and he's always sort of like. <sighs> yeah, he he's the captain. He's very much held apart from the crew, both by himself and the crew. Yep. Which causes some problems with some people who are all jerks. <laughs> <coughs> it's both. If anything, the best way to describe him is. He... He's he's a he's a character in and of himself, but I think he's also the character of the ship. Yes, because yeah. the obviously they they're both you know they're both even though the the Yamato obviously is a new build, it's it's still based on an old ship. It's mm -hmm. an old it's an old sailor. Yep. Um, you know, and he you know in himself he never leaves the ship. Um, nope. He you know that's the, you know he he basically becomes that character. Yep. Yeah, he's. He is the Avatar of the Yamato. Yep. Which is why he was called Captain Avatar in Star Blazers. Actually, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the ship is the Argo in Star Blazers also, which is appropriate, actually. A good name, but not as awesome as Yamato. <laughs> no. Um, and I'll talk. There's one other little important bit of information about Akira that needs to be said, is that it turns out you find out through the course of the show that he's sick. And in fact, it's later realized he's dying of radiation poisoning. And has been the entire mission. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like a boss. Yeah. yeah. So he... he it, it's it's not coincidental that, you know... Uh, I, I don't want to get into spoilers yet. We'll, we'll, we'll get to but we're actually spoiling... Like, actually spoiling plot elements at, at later a little bit later on. But uh, I do want to talk about some of the other characters first, though. Um, so that's Okita. Uh, the, so there's the... The two basically main protagonists are uh, Susumu Kodai, who's the uh, tactical officer of the ship, um, and was the main character of the original series, uh, and uh, the operations officer Yuki Mori, uh, who's one who is in the original series basically the only female character. Right. That is not yeah. the case anymore. Thank God. It, yeah. It, it's Yamamoto is fucking boss. Yeah, they they because they add in a, a one truly epically awesome character and some and a bunch of like really likable supporting cast who are all female too. Wait, yeah. hang on a sec, hang on a second. Oh, I fucking knew it. What? I just thought. Hang on. Let's see what the named Coda in the uh, Kodai in the uh, American version. <laughs> Derek Wildstar. Yep. Yes. Yes. <laughs> fucking Derek. Yep, Derek. Wild <laughs> man, baby. <laughs> well, I mean, at least he got a surname, because half of the others were just... Oh, God. Yep. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, Yuki Mori's uh, Nova in Star Blazers also. Yep. Right. 
Who, if I remember in Star Blazers, is actually an Iskandaran? No, she's not. Okay. No, there's a brief moment that Starsha thinks it's her sister, but it's not. Right. Um, Sorry, which, I didn't mean to interrupt that. That's fine. <laughs> oh, totally fine. Uh, but, okay. so... Hey, Eric. Uh, yeah, why don't you guys talk a little bit about, like, uh, what your thoughts on Kodai are? I'm, I'm curious to hear. Um, He's very much your... It's very much your, your space opera protagonist, honestly. Yep. Which makes sense, considering he's based on a character that originally came to fruition in 1977, you said? Or 74? 74. Yeah, thousands of years ago when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. <laughs> um, I think one of the things we actually came up with while we were watching the show, and I realized that, okay, yeah, there are going to be tropes in this, but hang on, this show probably invented those tropes. Yes, yes. it did. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And he, yeah, he's he's a bit of a hothead. He's uh, he's young and inexperienced, but eager. And yeah, he's very much... It's very much Luke Skywalker, honestly. With minus the minus the whininess. Yeah, with less whining. He does. He still does a bit of whining, but he gets over it pretty quick. Yeah. Well, Luke <laughs> gets still, over it fairly quick too. But he's still got the the tragic backstory. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, he does. <laughs> His entire family is dead. Uh, <laughs> most of them got blown up uh, during the planet bombing, and then his brother Which is the is captain true for of everyone on the fucking ship. <laughs> uh, not for everyone. Now, most no, people ship still have their families, but every you cannot tell me that everyone doesn't have like twelve people that they were close to that didn't get nuked in the. Oh planet. sure, oh absolutely. Um, they but yeah, like ten percent of the the current population and um, are looking at losing a viable gene uh, gene pool population within a year. <laughs> yeah, Earth doomed within a year is, is you yeah. know, the long and short of it. Um, but yeah, Wildstar's, you know, his oh, the only per member of his family who was not killed during the during the plan or initial planet bombing strike is his brother, who's in the Navy. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he's the one who's, he's the captain of the destroyer that does the rear guard thing to, to get Okita's Oki Oki ship out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so he spends a good portion of the, the first part of the series blaming Okita for that. Yeah. Yeah, to, to the point where he finds out that the only reason he's there is because his brother was supposed to have his job and he's dead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, his own brother's dead man's boots. Yep. <laughs> he takes it surprisingly well, actually. Yeah, admittedly, yeah. He goes, oh, 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 that's really sad that I was never, you know what, fuck it, I'm good yeah. at this job. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure I'm being awesome at this job instead of just good. Yep. I mean, he's worried at first that he's not, like, he's, because he's very low, he's you know he's very new to the navy. He's young, he's very young for for the position. He's worried that he's not really qualified for it. And yeah, he ends up being getting Worf's job, basically, a chief tactical officer. Yeah, well, that that's the that is his job. He is the chief tactical officer. And Okita basically says, "No, I've seen your records. I know if you're anything the, the like the person I think you you are, you'll do fine. Don't worry about it." <laughs> and. Okita, like in almost every other situation where he, he makes person judges judges people's personality, he's completely right. He's like, yeah, no, it, there are like a few people on the ship that he's he doesn't quite have spot on, shall we say? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's the usual thing. There's 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 the the trusted you know the bridge crew, the guys he's handpicked basically. There's a few others that have joined the crew that he's maybe not not quite so up on. And then there's the one or two old dogs that he's sailed with before that are the ones he gets to socialize with. Yep. Yeah, like the um like the engineer. Yep. Yeah. Tokugawa. Yes. Who is fucking awesome also. Yeah, pretty much all the old men in the show are awesome. Yes. Yeah, the um oh the um Oh, what's his name? The fucking goer is kinda awesome towards the <laughs> The oh, what's his what's the dude's name? The um, the Botswain is it? The Boson, yes. Boson, yeah. sorry, I can never pronounce that word right. <laughs> the, Bos the Boson's awesome. Oh, he's great. He's all over his man. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. And then there's uh, there's uh, Eric's favorite character. No, Yamamoto is fucking awesome. <laughs> yes, uh, I, but uh, we'll get to your motors one second. Uh, so yeah. Wild Death Wildstar, the other so the other main sort of, sort of 
primary main character is uh, Yuki Mori, the the operations officer. Yep. Uh, she, her job is basically, you know, she's the one who runs she's the, the sensors. She's the one the title card. Yes, uh, she's the one who runs the sensors. Um, that's her her main job during battle is keeping an eye on the sensors and identifying enemy threats and stuff like that. Um, but she also, you know, she does a lot of other stuff on the show, and she's for the first half of the show, she's actually really competent and interesting. Yes. Yeah. Then she becomes sort of the damsel in distress eventually, but still manages to be awesome despite that. Yeah. yeah. When when it starts off, she's obviously she's been in the navy a lot longer than Kodai. Yes. So you know, she's giving him shit. She's saying, what the f- "Who who are you trying to give orders to?" And you know yeah. she's she's doing her job and telling him to fuck off and get on with his. And then all of a sudden, it's like. Ah. Um, well, I mean, part of it is that she... Well, that to be means, fair, she does get nabbed in a commando raid by some of the most kick-ass badasses in, in the Gamelon fleet. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, yeah. a, that's sort of the end. But no, she the, you know, she and Kodai end up being attracted to each other and end up falling in love. Yeah. Not a surprise, really, but it actually works in the story. Yeah, they actually do a good job of, of establishing that early on. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, to, and to be fair, for a space opera, it's not too bad. They could have ended up being brother and sister. <laughs> yeah, uh, especially considering they, they could have been brother and sister. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, she's got her own little bit of tragic backstory in that she's an amnesiac. She can't remember anything past the anything before last year. Which, in and of itself, is a plot device. Yes, it is. Um, I, I I would love to talk more about her. Uh, she, but you know, she is a comp- very competent naval officer. Um, but she's also, you know, and she comes, she first comes across as very sort of, you know, cold and like, you, you that's that, Cinderella, honestly, it, it's a little, sort of it like, that's what you think she's going to be at first. And then she turns out to be sort of warm and engaging for the most part. She's just cold and a bit annoyed with, with Kodai because he kind of treat he was kind of a dick to her when they first met. Yeah, fair enough. So it's like, yeah, of course she's going to be kind of obnoxious. She's not, she's going to be standoffish with him. He was, obno- he was a bit, he was a dick. It's like, okay, that makes perfect sense. They eventually get to see what each other are actually like during the course of the trip, and they're both like, oh, you're not what I thought you were at first. Well, all right, then. Um, the other, the third character, which is probably, er- I'm guessing is Eric's favorite character. Uh, the other main... Because Okita is, fucking, is the fucking man. But Okita is the man. Uh, there's no question about that. But the other female lead, uh, Akira Yamamoto. For 2199. It was new, brand new to 2199 is Akira Yamamoto, uh, often referred to as Ray because um, she totally doesn't look like Ray from Evangelion at all. Nope, not at all. Oh, no, no. Uh, yeah, except, you know, she's not a fucking albino. She's got white hair, but she's got the whole caramel skin thing going on. Yeah, she's also got red eyes. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's intentional. Yeah, <laughs> that was okay, actually fair. intentional. <laughs> It was a little bit of a joke, from what I understand, <laughs> which is why she's called. Which is why this her is nickname like Ray, in that she actually has a <clears throat> fucking personality. Yes, <clears throat> she is. Well, it, again, she was. Her nickname is Ray. That's the funny part. Yeah. Um, partially because apparently, uh, depending on how you so read it, she uses for for her name can be interpreted also as Ray. Yeah, but at any rate, uh, she is. Uh, she starts off. She wants to be a fighter pilot when the thing starts. As a fucking accountant. <laughs> yeah, but she ends up being put basically put into accounting um, because she takes the, any job she can to get on the ship. Pretty yeah. much, um, her brother was a fighter pilot and died, and the leader of the fighter squadrons was her brother's best friend and is uh, the son of a Shinto priest, and who is also kind of awesome. Oh, he's this. he's great. I love him. He's a great he character. Is. But he's like, yeah, no, I don't want you being a fighter pilot. I don't want to see more of the people I love die. So, no, so, no. Congratulations. Go crunch some numbers for us. Because... <laughs> make sure that we're on budget. Because he is he is acutely aware of exactly how risky it is being a fighter pilot. It's not yeah. that she's female. It's that he she's her brother's sibling. She's the, yeah. she's the last of the line, honestly. Right, exactly. Literally, she is. He's basically doing his best friend a solid Right. Yeah. Trying to keep her out of danger. But uh, she eventually works. She eventually, um, in a 
been a moment of danger. Um, totally oh, hijacks a fighter. Hold it, hijacks one of the top, the two like prototype fighters, and goes and yeah, saves. Yeah, she doesn't just grab, didn't grab any old bird. She goes straight to the top, <laughs> and she goes off, and she basically saves everybody's bacon. Yeah, and this eventually gets the attention of you know. Kodai and he and she and he basically says she asks you know she wants to be transferred to the fighter squadron, and he says well I'll talk to the captain about it and see see what he thinks, and Avatar's like well she did save our bacon and we need all the good fighter pilots we can get so <laughs> yes yes he uses the, that's what's going to happen <laughs> he uses the sage tactical advice that you know she just top gunned him one of our experimental pi- uh, experimental fighters we'd never get him behind the <sighs> stick before yeah she can fly. <laughs> And this is happening at the same time that the the leader of the fighter squadron is going. You know, I should it probably was talk. Mistake to keep her out of it. She's really good. Uh, I she should, should probably talk to the tactical officer about having her transferred. <laughs> and he's basically the before a mission before a briefing. You know, Kodai comes in to talk to him, and he's like, "I want to talk to you after the briefing. He's to talk to you about something." And he's like, "Yeah, I'll, t- I'll cover it after the briefing." By the way, before we start, we got a new member of the fighter squadron here, Akira Yamamoto. And he, the, the, he's like, "I it all right." <laughs> So what was the thing you wanted to talk about? That right there. You covered it for me. We're done. I mean, his reaction is literally, doesn't matter now. <laughs> <coughs> but Yamamoto, and it starts off, you know, she sort of very clearly develops something of a crush on, on Kodai. Uh, because they get along well. Um Right. And to be fair, though, Ray does kind of develop a crush on anyone that shows any psych- any kind of competency. Yeah. To a degree, also, she... especially in combat. Yeah, well, it's not just that, but it's, it's she's you know she very clearly uh, she very clearly has feelings for Gunner. She likes him, mm. but you know, and, and eventually when she realizes that you know Kodai and Moray are going to be a thing, she's like, oh, oh, well, I'll just back off. Not a problem. Not a big deal. She she like I can. It's not a big deal. It does not become a love triangle. Yeah, like, yeah. they spend a little time hinting that it's going to be a love triangle, and then they go, nope. Nah, that's dumb. We're not going to yeah. do this. It, it's it's the military mindset. She's like, oh. Well, it's not even well, this. That, uh, yeah, it's like, well, what, what else is around? Yamamoto's just totally like, no nonsense, I've got no time for this bullshit. I got shit to do. Mm. Oh, there's going to be a fucking romantic triangle bullshit? Nah, fuck that. No, I got no, more no. important things to worry about. I got gamelons to blow up in my kick-ass fighter. Right. And she's probably one of the That's most one of the things I actually really like about her. She's just like, no, nah, fuck that noise. I, I I don't have time for that bullshit. <sighs> yeah, and she's also probably the one of the one of the crew who's most anti gamelon Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's got kind of a hate on for them because I mean, she's uh, she you know they uh, Earth at one point terraformed Mars uh, and she and colonized it and she's her family's from mars originally and that was the first colony the, that colony got wiped up by the gamelons which means her entire family except her brother died on mars uh, and then her brother died fighting the gamelons this should sound familiar by the way <laughs> uh, there's a reason that she's actually initially very attracted to, to kodai is because they have basically the same backstory yeah uh, so it's a very much a case of wow we are we basically have the same story and we get along, and I think you're cute. This is great. And then, oh, he's fallen for someone else. Oh well. All right. Yeah. Fair cop. I'll live with it. I've got fighters to fly. I'll be okay. Plus, who's this hot Gamelon chick we have on the ship now? Yeah. Well, <laughs> that takes a little bit. That takes a little while. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Shall we well, say? Yeah, the traditional brawl beforehand. <laughs> well, again, she hates Gamelons early on. Um. Okay, we're not gonna. Over break, break. We could spend. I mean, the 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 cast is very large. Yes. yes. Uh, and it's an ensemble cast. Basically, everybody gets their moment to shine. Yeah, there's very yes. few characters in this that just don't do anything. Yeah, like even down to the you know the cute girl who's sort of like uh, the a warrant this cute girl warrant officer who basically her main job seems to be doing the after hours radio show. Yeah, she's got yeah, a, a couple of jobs she's, around, but she's nowhere near as busy as the officers. Her job seems to be largely Neelix's job on Voyager. Yeah, she's sort of the morale officer to a large degree, except yeah, that except she also she really is annoying. Well, no, she's not annoying. Uh, she's quite likable, and on top of that, she you know when Mori's not when Mori has to be doing something else and is not at the sensors, she's the one who fills in there. Yep. 
proving that is, is that one of those oh yeah like like these these like you know the 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 lower ranking officers who have like their own little moments here and there they're all competent yes um but there are a couple of characters we should talk about um I, I do want to touch on but yeah Yamamoto is awesome she's badass she's no nonsense she's great and as I said for, for a character that's been inserted into this story and has a fairly major role doesn't feel forced nope not at all she she fits in perfectly she, she grew very organically into the into her role into the show absolutely um the next one is uh the next sort of major player is uh Daisuke Shima the navigation officer on the ship and I basically, and by navigation officer, he basically, I mean, he does plot out the, 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 the jumps and the routes, but he also actually flies the ship in combat. Yeah. He's and the ship is the helm officer. He's the helm officer. Yep. And, um, uh, he's, he ends up, he's, he's Kodai's best friend. Um, they came up, they basically went to Academy together and he's generally just a likable dude. Um, yeah. He's a nice guy. His dad was in the Navy and is one of those officers that basically everybody goes, yeah, Shima, you know, Captain Shima was awesome. He was a great guy. We all loved him. He's dead now. He died during the initial encounter with the Gamelons. <coughs> Dope. Yeah, uh, and we'll, we'll This talk... seems to be a story. This seems to be a theme. <laughs> <clears throat> well, yes, it's a war story, so. Um, again, so I, at this point, so there, there's Shima, um, uh, the other, I think the last major, the two more important characters, uh, who are two of the sort of more scientific people in the ship. Mm. There's the ship's first officer, Sonata, who is... <laughs> Imagine Spock and Data had a baby. Kinda, yeah! <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> he is... <laughs> he, he's, he's not very... rational. <laughs> he's very rational. He's doesn't emote much. Um, he's very logical and scientific. Uh... He's brilliant, and he's it. He heart and behind this facade of not even facade, but his exterior, this cold, calm, emotionless exterior, is this heart of gigantic heart of gold. Yeah, yeah. he's not the type that's going to screw you because logic says so. He might be driven by logic, but at the end of the day, he makes rational choices. Yeah, and he, but he also, I mean, he genuinely likes people. Yes. Yeah. He, even when he, people he doesn't understand, like he does not get like his Kodai's older brother um, was was Sonata, turns out was Sonata's best friend, and they are polar opposites because you know Kodai's old, uh, Musum, Musum Kodai is like you know he's into poetry, he's flighty, he's you know rambunctious, impulsive, um, impulsive very, yeah, um, very much an extrovert that kind of thing. Yeah, he's an extrovert and. Uh, Sonata's an introvert, largely, and they are the best of friends. Like, Sonata doesn't, like, he, like, you know, Kodai lends his, lends, lends him a book of poetry, and he, which he wants to read because he knows Kodai loves poetry, and he's like, I gotta figure this out. I don't get, I still don't get poetry, but yeah. you clearly like it. I, I can't say it's bad. And he hangs on to this book after Kodai's death because he's like, and eventually gives it to, um, to, uh, the younger Kodai. Kodai the younger. Kodai the younger. Anyway, so this is this was your brother's, you know, and I I want you to make sure you 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 should have it back. Because I don't get poetry, but it's you know. But he cared a lot about it, so here. And I I I care about I I care about poetry now, even though I don't understand it. Because it was something my best friend cared about, which I think is actually really sweet. Yeah. And you know, it's there's all these wonderful little moments and. There's this one moment, and we're getting to the point where we have some minor spoilers here. We're going to be touching on some spoiler stuff going forward, I think. Yeah. Mm. Um, there's this moment where, um, which is the proof of Sonata is a fucking genius and thinks much yes. faster than you think you did. Oh, th right. Where, Even us watching it, we're just like, oh, fuck, no. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And then it's like, you clever bastard. <laughs> oh, <that was laughs> well done, sir. Well done. So, they are on this uh, the satellite. This this basically it's a it's a it's the control system of this interstellar gate, which will help shorten the journey to Iskandar, Iskandar by a lot. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to reactivate it. And so they walk in this room. It's this big room with a control panel. And basically, Sonata walks in alone and says, "You two stay out here for a moment." He walks and starts doing stuff. And it's a big room with these pools and everything around. And then he starts reactivating the thing. And when he starts reactivating the, the system, 
The doors slam shut. And he goes, fuck. And he looks, he doesn't say fuck. He sort of looks down and realizes that in order to restart, it's going to release his big neutron pulse and pulse of neutron radiation in the room. And he's like, well, and that's going to kill, ba- it's going to sterilize her and kill basically everything in there. And he's like, oh, this, well, I'm doomed. And he locks the door. And we're sitting there, and he, like, Kodai and, and uh, Moray are sitting there, no, you got, got to let us in, let us help you, get, get you out of there and such. And he's like, no, just stay out there. And he basically does this whole thing where he explains, you know, that he was Kodai's brother's best friend. And he's like, there are a lot of things I wish I could have, t- I, I, I should tell you about before before this goes off, etc. And eventually the thing goes off, and they're like, oh, God, no. And the door, they open the door, and there's nothing to be seen. He's not there. And then you sort of, they sort of, the, the camera pans to sort of foot level. And you sort of see past you know, Kodai's feet to the pools of water behind. And Gav, Eric, Gav and Eric, and I had the same reaction the first time I watched it, both sort of say, oh, you, as Gav said. Yeah, you, oh, you clever fuck. <laughs> because he crawls up out of the water and he points out that neutrons don't pass through water easily. And it's like, he's actually right. That's actually scientifically correct. It's <laughs> one of the reasons why they use water in nuclear reactors. Holy shit. Okay, then. Yeah. <laughs> And the best thing about it, think about that scene. He's just dropped the deathbed speech to Kodai. Yes. Knowing just, full <laughs> that, that whole episode he's living all the, the friggin' death plagues. So he's just yeah. death Knowing plague full well that he's gonna survive. <laughs> you git Because he knows he's not gonna die. Well he he's pretty sure he's not gonna die, but he figures I yeah. should tell I is the moment of I could die here is I should, probably should tell Kodai this stuff. This is stuff he should know. Because there's a chance I might die. I might not make it to the water in time. He's still a gate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he probably should have said this stuff earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, he wasn't thinking about the, like, you know, he would be like, you know, freaking Kodai out more. He's like, oh, I should probably tell him this stuff. I, I've been putting yeah. it off too long. But it's this wonderful moment of, oh god, you're far too smart for your own good, aren't you, Sonata? <laughs> we haven't even gotten to the fucking villains yet. No, and that's where I want to go to shortly. There's one other character I want to talk about, which is uh, Lieutenant Nimi. Uh, uh, yes. Sonata is basically, she's the information, she's the intelligence officer on the ship. Uh, and mm-hmm. she is, she went to the academy with uh, Sonata and the old Elder Kodai. Uh, and it turns out she and Kodai had were, were a thing for a long while, um, and she still carries the torch for the her for for him, uh, despite that he's quite quite dead. He's uh, very dead, yes. Uh, <laughs> asterisk. Uh, <laughs> Spoilers. But uh, so she's and she she is also brilliant. Uh, she's a brilliant scientist. She's smart. She's clever, and she's. One of the characters that has a bit of a uh, a secret going on. Yeah, this is where we get into a bit of spoilers thing. So it turns out that before the uh, is before Sarsha Viskandar basically sent her message with of hope to Earth, like you come come here and because that came like only about a year before the show starts, and yeah. the War of the Game ones have been going on for six years. Uh, basically, Earth was like Earth was basically okay. What the fuck can we do? Our only hope at this point is basically get as many people off the planet and go find some other planet to live on. This is called the Azumo plan. Nimi was part of, was, was, was working on the Azumo plan, it turns out. And this is hinted at, like the Azumo plan is mentioned in like the s- second episode. Yeah. When they basically like, board the uh, ship. So we're, so we're scrapping the Azumi plan. The Azumo plan, we're moving to this, the new plan, the Yamato plan. Um, and like later on, like there's a bit where you see her like drinking coffee. She puts her coffee cup down. It says Azumo plan, you know, Azumo staff on the cup and such. It turns out that a large number of people, the number of people in the, both in the military and there are a bunch of people on the ship, still want to go forward with the Azuma plan because they think the Yamato plan is batshit insane. And it kind of is. <laughs> yes. So they basically, you know, she, her, one of the things she does is that whenever they're in a system with a planet, she looks at it to see if it's actually possibly habitable just in case. And that's perfectly rational. Yes. And whenever, whenever like, Okita says, we don't have time to, like, explore the planet here, she goes, fine. I can live with that. But things start getting a little bit more desperate. This is before they find the jump gate. Like things are, it's like they're falling a bit, bit behind. They're falling behind schedule. It's taking a long time. The food replication system is on the fritz. Everybody's grumpy. And it turns out that there's a 
a cadre of people on the ship, all of whom were put there, put in the crew by the people who ran the Azuma plan. And their plan is basically, if we do find an actual habitable planet, we'll take over the ship, uh, come back home and get as many people as we can and fly them out there. Now, there are two problems with this. Problem number one is it involves basically, since, you know, virtually everyone else in the ship has been chosen to do, chosen to do, because, and are part of the Yamato plan and all basically are, are cool with it, you're probably going to have to basically take over the ship and it's probably going to be... Yeah. Probably going to be messy. Problem number two is at this point it's become abundantly clear that the Gamelons are every fucking where. Yeah. And they're, if, even if you go to a new planet, they're going to find you and they're going to be pissed. This is not going to fucking work. Especially since the, the planet they find... Isn't it actually a Gamelon base? No. It's a planet that had another spe- ascension species on it that had received, that apparently was in trouble for, of some in some way, and oh. the Iskandarians reached out to them because there's a wrecked Iskandarian ship there with yeah. more right. map data. Which which is how they find out about the uh, the gate. But it's deep in Gamelon territory. Yeah, oh, it, oh yeah. It, it's in the fucking middle of Gamelon territory. Yeah. It's in the. It's you know. It's outside. It, it's. It's not exactly prime real estate to you uh, to settle when you're uh, trying to escape the. Uh, you know, it's, it's trying to escape these guys. Yeah. Also, it means they'd have to fly back home, back through the fleets they've just run away from. Yeah. It's a terrible plan. And they basically, you know, they take it. They they choose them when the captain is having an episode and is ill and is in his and is laid up in his room. Um. They basically convince uh, Nini basically seduces and convinces uh, Shima to join her, yep. to join it. But both she and Shima are basically of the opinion, like, yeah, you know, she's like, this can be done cleanly and easily. It's the best plan. Nothing needs to go particularly badly, especially if I get like him on my side. Now, the other person who's sort of important in this group is the chief of security. Ah, uh, yes, Captain Douche Nozzle, uh, whose name escapes me. Oh, Ito, that's it, what it is. His name is Captain Douche Nozzle. It's Ito. No, it's Douche Nozzle. Uh, and Ito is... Uh, it, it, it's that, too. That's the translation. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's one of those... Uh, so, you know, he's one of those guys who's... Uh, he's character design. He's character design. He's always got his eyes like basically effectively closed. It's a classic sort of anime trope. Those guys are always, you know, shifty and cunning and not completely trustworthy. They're use they're often bad guys, but they're occasionally like just like these super clever, manipulative good guys. He's the former. <laughs> He's a dick. He's yeah. Also not that smart and kind of paranoid. Kind of paranoid. Yeah. Okay. He does not. Let's just put it this way. He does not trust aliens at all. Like yeah. the his reasoning behind going through the Azuma plan is because. The Yamato plan is being held, being given to us by aliens. We can't trust any aliens. They're only out to screw us. Fuck that. Yeah, he's the xenophobe. Oh yeah, yeah. To put it mildly. <laughs> yeah. The the others the others uh, reasons to hate. They've lost people. He just is xenophobic. I mean, he might have, he also might have lost people. They don't really go into his backstory. No. But oh my god. So, but he basically steps it up and makes it into a full on you know full on mutiny. Uh, and it turns out the plan ends up not working because one of his security officers, whom he thought was on his side, turns out that someone like one of the one of the people in the Admiralty back home inserted him into the into the Azuma plant group as a mole. Yeah, he's a straight up double agent. <laughs> and he's the best part is is this young, unassuming like you know, like bordering on a kid, who turns out is actually really smart and clever and has basically completely diffuses the whole thing by like slipping a note to Shima basically saying play along until you know the right moment uh, <laughs> and basically between him Shima basically buying time uh, and Yamamoto continuing to be a complete fucking badass because she's awesome <laughs> um, the, the mutiny is forestalled um, and most of the ringleaders are locked up including Nimi 
Although they eventually let her out because her heart really wasn't the right place for the most part, and she really... And more importantly, she has an unreplicatable skill set that they need at the time. Yes, because it's like, well, we need we need you, uh, and also, you're not a complete... You're not a dick. <laughs> but again, there's a lot of sort of things that would, like, in, like, if you were look at it rationally, like, wow, you just did something that basically should get you locked up forever. Like, for, like in a, like a real military would get you drummed out. And you're a smart person. But you executed. Like, it, that was mutiny and treason. Right. Or like, you know, you 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 stole you stole you you took out you stole a one of our fighters and had a dog fight with uh with a, one of our let one of our let a prisoner out of out of the out of her cell, stole gave her gave gave her back her fighter, stole one of our fighters so you two of you could dog fight. Mm. Oh right. Yeah. No, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, she's awesome. <laughs> and no, in a real mil- in a normal military situation, the punishment for this would be you're out. <laughs> yeah, she gets six days in the brig because she's their second best. Pi- she's either the best or second best pilot, depending on how you feel about Kodai. Oh, she's better than Code uh, than Kodai because she's awesome. He's one of the best pilots in the ship. It turns out, yeah. but and he flies the other prototype. It's his the, the other prototype's his fighter. Um. So it turns out, like, they're, like, you know... So she's, like... So she's... Her skill set's basically irreplaceable. And, like, they just don't... They 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 have... The crew they have is the crew they have. Yeah. They can't yeah. requisition anybody else. I guess they go to go to accounting and say, does anyone else here turn to be a, super, a good, a ta- naturally talented f- fighter pilot? Anybody? Well, to be fair, I was say, last time they had to do accounting, that's what they found, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yeah. Uh, but from there, we should talk a bit about. Uh, we also should, we should move on to talk about the bad guys, the Gamelons. Yes. yes. And when we talk about the Gamelons, we have to start with Dessler. Yes. Their leader, Albert De- Albert Des- Albert Dessler Dessler. Hail Caesar himself. Yeah. <laughs> Dessler is amazing. He's pretty damn awesome. He is in the original series, in the original Yamato. Uh, he's like you listen to the, watch the original Yamato now. You like wow. He is the stereotypical you know baritone stentorian regal asshole villain. He's such a stereotype, and then you realize oh no, he's the original he's the first <laughs> or yeah. one of the first. <laughs> and the night the interesting thing is the one little they they the for Yamato twenty one nine nine. They took a little something from the from the from Star Blazers, yeah. Which was uh, in the in the dub on Star Blazers, uh, the guy they got to do Deslock's voice, uh, Eddie Allen. He ends up giving him this very cultured British accent, yeah. And he adds this layer to Deslock that is he he takes him from your sort of stereotypical Stentorian villain to this. To a Bond villain. To a Bond villain, yeah. Yeah. And a chunk of that sort of cultured affect moves its way into 2199. Yes. And he is very much this... He is your... He is the... Cla- he is... He, he has combined sort of the best of both worlds in that he is, you know, this proud, regal man with this very sort of cultured, faintly hedonistic air about him. Yes. Uh, you know, like, all his bodyguards are attractive women. Um, because why wouldn't they be? Yeah. Uh, I have an empire to choose from. I'm going to have nothing but hot chicks. Yeah. Also, basically, don't get me some wine, because I should always have a glass of wine in my hands. Why they, am I they, not drunk yet? They went a little past Caesar, but th- thankfully stopped before Caligula. Yes. <laughs> As I said, he's a little bit hedonistic. Yeah. <laughs> he's got an air of it. He's got a whiff of he- hedonism about him. Yeah. Um, he does always have a drink in his hand unless he's actively, like, fighting or playing space chess. Yes. <laughs> or giving speeches. Yeah. Which he does on multiple occasions and delivers these amazing speeches, honestly. Oh, I will say, though, there's, one, there's, oh, there's always parts of his, of, his, uh, of his scenes that I love. It's the utter face of, oh, God, boredom. Whenever he's getting... A report from a, a minor underling. Yes. <laughs> Why am I listening to Gover again? Why is it? He... 
dead yet. Yeah. <laughs> Just shut up, please. There's a wonderful scene, actually, which I think sums up Deslock slash Desler, whatever you want to call him. I call him Deslock because that's what I grew up calling him. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I like it better also. But Desler's a good name, don't get me wrong. Basically, he's got... Basically, all, like, all his, like officers on planet are gathered together in this big in his in his throne room and he's sitting on his throne and he's brought them together to for a for this for it's part of their sort of celebration of the of you know the history of Gamelon. it's a big holiday and he, basically uh and he's come up with a way a sort of a a, a thing of entertainment to, to, and this is early on in the series where he's basically laid a trap for the yamato and the entire plan is his own scheme and he's, they've got they've got a ship in the area, sure, f- sh- filming it and such. And like you know, he basically sort of says that you know, like let you know. And at one point, he basically says, let's applaud them as they they uh, the are uh, these are our enemies as they go they go into this into this you know into this this danger. And one of the the his underlings out there, this rotund man, starts laughing at it. So you know, <laughs> you're hysterical, <laughs> my lord. You know, just, he's going on about like you know, it's like you know, this is a great comedy and such. And Desert's looking at him, has this look of the fuck are you? And he reaches down, just sort of flips this little button on his on his throne, and a trap door opens up under the guy's feet, and he plummets down, closes it, <laughs> and he says, "We don't need of it. We have no need of such disgusting men in our empire." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does play the part well. He's like, you know, when he says, "Give them a round of applause for being brave," he means, he it. means it. He means it. Yes. He doesn't mean mock them. So, right. No, seriously. These are these are a minor species we're sending to their death. They don't know it. We're obviously going to kill them, but at least applaud their bravery. Yeah, the 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 Deslock, The thing about the th- I think part, the really interesting thing about Deslock and his sort of way, well, how he looks at the Yamato's crew, and this is more true in the original series, honestly, is he actually like the the original series? If you combine like the original first season plus second season plus third season, Deslock has this arc where he goes from. Like yeah, they're 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 beneath they're beneath me, but I sort of like I'm, they they interest me. I'm interested by them, and he right. sort of looks at them, studies them, and eventually they they ruin all his plans. And he and the second season is all about his hatred and desire to crush them, and then he eventually comes to this point where he begins sort to realize for it's them. not even it, it moves past grudging. He actually realizes that they aren't that different from me, and the third season. The Gamelons actually end up helping, right? With the uh, with the Common Empire, not the Common Empire. No, no, he's he's working with the Common Empire. The third season, the bowl is the Bolar Wars. Oh, right, right, right. The Common Empire. He's he's working for the Common Empire in that one because they're giving him his chance to crush the crush the, the Yamato. Right. Um, <clears throat> but that's the second season. <laughs> but in this, like, the, it's a little bit different in this in that he is, as Gav said, he is so terminally bored with people. Mm. It's very clear he's been alive a very long time. Like they drop hints that like he's been around a lot longer than you'd think by looking at him. Mm. And it's very clear he's smarter than basically everybody around him. And he's sick to death of he's just he finds people terminally boring. Yeah. He he and, really has I'll play the part cuz it's required of me, but I really don't give a fuck. <laughs> uh, he cares about basically he cares about the Gamelon Empire. He cares about um, his own uh, power base. And there's one other important thing he cares about, and it's the reason he's doing all of this, which is fucked up beyond all belief. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'll get yeah. to that in a second. <laughs> That's also some major spoilers. Yes. And I'm not sure we'll do that. We'll talk about this episode because I think I'm not sure we're going to talk about it during this because I I kind of want people if you haven't seen it. Get, Deslock actually has a reason for wanting to basically create this gigantic empire and conquer the galaxy. He actually has a reason for it. They explain it, and it's kind of fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> but at any rate, the thing with the Yamato is they actually pique his interest. Yeah. Because they keep on pulling their getting out of these it should be it should be completely just a slaughter, and they keep on winning. They're not supposed to be able to do that. How are they doing this? All right, Goer's in charge. But Goer's not in charge anymore. You keep on mentioning Goer. We should talk about him. We'll get to him next. He's the next person I want to talk about, actually. <laughs> but so he, they, they, they catch his interest. And so 
it's not just that he like he actually does respect like you know he actually has this sort of respect for other people's cleverness from time to time despite the fact that he is a megalomaniac <laughs> he's a megalomaniac and he's terminally bored but he he respects cunning and tenacity which the motto has in spades right like they are clearly inferior to him because everybody's inferior to Deslock. Well, almost everyone's inferior to Deslock. There's one person he doesn't consider consider inferior, but we won't get into that. Uh, and but everyone else is below him, and like the Yamato's below him, but they're different and interesting, and they're doing something he's not seen before. What a neat bug! Exactly, yeah, which is Basically, very much yeah. his attitude for most of the series. Is like, what a neat bug. I wonder what I'll do next. <laughs> and then they completely destroy everything he's done. And he's like, oh, fuck these guys. <laughs> Wait a minute. You're not supposed <laughs> to be able to do that. Yeah. Because uh, once again. Fuck you. <laughs> once again, even Deslock, as, as, as wise as he is, underestimates the Yamato. Yeah. Because it's the toughest hunk of shit in the galaxy. Pretty much. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> so clearly they got freaking Soviet era Russians to build the fucking <coughs> oh my god but yeah so th that's death like Gore is uh, Gore is one of the main recurring antagonists uh, villains of the series he's a villain yeah. he is the general who's in charge of the Milky the Milky Way battle theater right he's in charge of the yeah the the, the Milky Way theater and um He's a fuck up. He is. He is simultaneously this wildly overconfident, bombastic idiot who is also simultaneously the world's biggest sycophant. Yes. Because he and sucks up to anybody who outranks him. Yes. And, and, yeah, and he's he, very he's literally with. Um, making a good impression on them. Right. Yeah. It, it, Go, Goa has his level. And where you rank either above or below him directly uh, affects how he was, how he treats you. Right. And Deslock is like his god. Yeah. I mean, he... Uh, uh, there's like... Literally, that is like... Anybody contradicting Deslock, he's like, no, fuck you, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Deslock can't be wrong. He's never wrong. He's the best. Oh, you Deslock, you're awesome. Shut up. Notice me, senpai, notice me. Yes. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> God, and, yes. And his way he sucks up to Deslock whenever he talks to him, you, as, 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 they, as Gav pointed out, and Eric pointed out, he's just got, Deslock has his face of, oh, God, it's gore. <laughs> oh. Okay, i got to listen to him because he's actually giving, giving a report. I've got to, I technically have to listen to this. Oh, would you please hurry up? Get to the point. <laughs> yes, I know, I, I, I know, I know. You you would, you would, do anything for me, blah, 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 blah. Just the pertinent information, please. <laughs> yeah, and then, like, one of the first times, it's like, he spends five minutes kissing his ass and going through all these titles, and, you know, and it's like, the report, oh, um, Terra, the Terrans have launched a ship. And Deslock's like, so? The fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Deal with it. It's yeah. your job. <laughs> And Gore just constantly, completely underestimates. I'm like more so than anybody else in the show. Like, ver like almost every other Gamelon commander that like directly encounters them underestimates them at first, with one exception. Completely underestimates them. Yes. And then they beat them, and if they survive, which a lot of them don't, they go, "Oh well, fuck." Yeah. Okay. The ones that don't survive are like, oh fair, shit. Gore is capable of learning. We see him start to learn. <laughs> yes, it just takes him longer than most. <laughs> um, the primary the primary example of a, the Gamelon commander who does not underestimate the Yamato completely he still underestimates them but that's because you know is uh, is Admiral Do is General Do Do Dommel who is totally not Rommel nope not at all oh, no. not in any way shape or form nope not at all he is not called the Wolf of Space <laughs> he's totally called the Wolf of Space yep <laughs> Dommel starts out basically running the uh, being in charge of the Battle theater in the Lesser Magellanic Cloud. Uh, the Gamelon Empire is based in the Greater Magellanic Cloud. By the way, the Gamelons are everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Did I mention that? 
and basically he's fighting these uh, these uh, a species called the Catlanteans, who are the, they're the common empire from season two of Yamato, the original Yamato. It turns out you see their ships and they're they're common empire ships. It's like oh, so and that's where they're they're going to and when they do the second season because apparently they're working on it. That's what it's going to be about. And I'm 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 giddy because yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Deslock basically so but Dommel basically Deslock basically says okay. Gore's fucked up continuously and can't stop the Amato. Fuck it. Dommel, get to the... Go take over the Milky Way Theater and crush them. And Dommel's like, but but I'm in the middle of a battle and I, I'm sort of... We're sort I'm of this... a, I'm, I'm do, I, I have a very important job that I'm doing right now according to your orders. Yeah, yeah. well, it's new orders. So pull him, to pull him back. Go to shit. I don't care. Just deal with it. Just to try and get him to leave the front line, he's like, this, this has got a, a medal for you. He's like... So, so I don't want a medal. Fuck him. I'm, I'm busy. And, were, and everyone's like, "It's nice. Uh, medals are nice, but I'm busy right now. We can put up the <laughs> things off." But no, you, yeah. no, you get your ass home now. <laughs> because he gets a communication from the from the leader of the entire of all the fleets, uh, Admiral Dietz, and Dietz is like, "Yeah, Desler, uh, Admiral, uh, Lord Desler wants you to come home and receive a medal and such." He's like, "I'm in the middle of a battle right now," because he's literally in the middle of a battle right now. Yeah. But the really interesting thing about Do- about Dommel is he basically is constantly saying to it like every anybody under him's like, look, just like someone says, well, we why why should we do it this way? I mean, they, we've got them crushed, you know. We why why should we take extra precautions? Like, because we we should never underestimate our opponents because the second we do that, we're fucked. Yep. <laughs> Which the rest of the Gamelon fleet prove repeatedly, mm-hmm. over and over and over again. <laughs> Fucking Imperial Guard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh god. But so Dommel comes back. Dommel says, well, okay, if Dessler's actually ordering me to take over a new theater, come back, I have to obey. He's, you know, he is my liege lord. Fine. That, he, is, that... he is the boss. He does sign the paychecks. And frankly, technically speaking, yeah, while I consider myself, deli- this, is a, this is an important, you know, important thing for the Empire. We've got the Atlanteans completely on the ropes. I, yeah. How badly could they fuck it up? Right. And well, we don't know. Yeah. And the answer to that is we don't know yet. Yeah. It is getting to the point where the uh, the, 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 the the lost ship count, the body count uh, from the Milky Way, uh, you know, the, uh, is starting to rise. Right. It's rapidly. like, it's like you know, we probably should do something about that. So, yeah, fine. So he goes, he goes there. He uh, requisitions uh, an experimental ship from, from the fleet that basically only Dessler can clear to actually go off and do stuff. Uh, and... Comes up with a, and basically spends a while hounding the uh, the the Yamato and basically they keep getting out by the skin of their teeth and Dommel's reaction to this is oh well okay well next plan fine it's like oh they survived that well they're okay they're they're good not a surprise it's not like he, he's not like underestimating them he's just coming up with a plan that he thinks he's will work testing. right right he's probing their defenses for for the most part yeah but, yeah and he basically and he eventually has to, has them cornered. And is going to crush them when he is immediately ordered home by because there's some very important event that's happened on Gamelon, or just off Gamelon as it turns out. Uh, in that, um, well, it apparently Dessler was on a ship to go visit uh, the main base where Gore's, Gore's out, where Gore and Dommel are operating out of, and his ship explodes, and it looks like Dessler's dead. Oh, it's a fucking coup! I hate coups. <laughs> so he's like, uh, uh but. Uh, we just need like a few minutes more to kill to finish them off. No, come home now. Everyone home now. Literally, if he just spent we're going five to more win, minutes. Give me fifteen minutes in a candy bar. <laughs> because the Yamato is completely outnumbered, surrounded, and basically dead. And then there's a fucking bureaucratic douche nozzle on the radio to him saying, No, you come home now, mister. <sighs> and he comes home and he ends up being framed for the assassination and things look bad. It eventually turns out Dessler's not actually dead. Someone was, pl- was plotting against him. So he used a double to flush them out. Uh, and he eventually says, okay, well, Dommel, uh, sorry about that, dude. You did me a solid. Why don't you go and take care of that? <laughs> well, I would, sir, except we lost the fleet I used because <laughs> I wasn't there. Well, yeah. The Imperial Guard will help you out. Right? Talk to the SS Git. <laughs> and the SS Git says, oh yeah, sure, I can spare you four old ships and a bunch of old men and new recruits. 
but but I was really kind of need a, a fleet here. You've seen what they've done. No, no, no. This is what you're getting. This is more than enough to handle. Just, just to handle both their politics. Okay. <laughs> fine, fine. I can do. I can work with this. I can work with this. I'm a fucking genius. And he comes. He basically and he's. He sees like he looks at the situation. And says, okay, well, the fastest way here is through this area of space, which is unbelievably dangerous and could just kill them traveling through it. The smart way to come, to get to get to where they're going would be to go around it. They're going to go through there. From everything I've seen of their commander, he's going to go through there. And, and, and he's completely correct. <laughs> because uh, Okita's like, that, that, Okita's navigation, uh, briefing is sort of similar. It's like, well, the smart thing to do is to go around it. Okita's like, that's exactly where the Gamelons are going to be waiting. We're going to go through it. Are you sure, sir? Yes, I have the utmost confidence in our helmsman. Thanks for the pressure, sir. <laughs> <laughs> And it leads to the the singular biggest fleet battle in the series. Mm. And it's awesome. And it's amazing. And the Yamato wins. I wouldn't say the biggest fleet battle, the most dramatic of them. Yeah. Well, it's yeah, it's uh, not. It's really just five ships. It's We've yeah, seen, like huge, like swarms of Gabalon ships before. But it's it's the biggest in terms of in terms of length of the actual battle. Yes. Yeah. Plus, it's Akita versus Donald. Right. Yes. And it goes. It it. It, and it's an amazing fight, and the Yamato barely wins. Yeah, it gets the shit knocked out of it. Yeah. But they win. No surprise. Earth wins. Unshocking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they, you know, Okita and Dommel have a brief conversation before Dommel dies. Um, I'm not going to spoil what happens there because that's a cool. It's a good moment. Yeah, uh, he goes out like a boss. He does go out like a boss because he's fucking Dommel and he's amazing. <laughs> Um, and from there, you know, this, it, 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 during this battle is when, um, Mori is kidnapped, uh, and... By totally not friggin' Captain Harlock. Nope. Nope. This guy's mustache. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and this leads to, you know, basically meeting up with the, uh, the former admiral of the fleets who ended up being, also being framed for the assassination of Deslock and ends up in prison and he gets busted out and it's decided, okay, f fuck everybody else in the leadership. The Empire's going to shit and it has been. You can see how, like, a lot of things are just going wrong. Like, like, er like, you know, it's like, you know, normal citizens are being busted off to prison planets and he's just like, and he ends up on one of them. He's like, you know what? I'm done. I will, I'm going to basically stage a stage a rebellion to basically you know yeah get gamble on back. <laughs> I'm so you think I'm uh, I'm a part of a coup? Then fine, fuck you. I am part of a coup now. Screw you all. Because <laughs> Destler right, leaves him. Daughter, she's awesome. She was the one you had in your ship before. <laughs> right. So basically, you know, the Yamato and Deets meet up. They basically they can't completely like come to terms yet because they're still sort of like they're, they're still. But he says, yeah, okay. I'm not at war with you guys now. I have my own problems. I've got to f figure out a way to basically save the Gamelon yeah. Empire from itself. He's like, yeah, I'm not going to help you guys, but I'm not going to hinder you either. Yeah. In fact, I'm probably going to end up helping you by accident, so just yeah. go do your thing. Right, <laughs> and uh, as a testament of goodwill, my daughter, who's a character you meet earlier on, and ends up who's the prisoner we mentioned, who's a fighter pilot, She'll be our liaison to you, so that we you know we can keep we can sort of keep keep in touch, and she'll make sure that you know she's there mostly so that you know to help you guys against the Gamelons if they're doing something really hinky. Because you guys apparently don't want, aren't here really to fight us. You're here to basically just save your planet. I'm totally okay with that. <laughs> it's like fine if you're not actually at, trying to like destroy us. Cool. You're just trying to get to this place to get to Iskand. Apparently, you're trying to get to Iskandar to. Get this thing to go home. Fine, great. I, I, I'm totally okay with this. Fine, go get your MacGuffin. We don't care. We've got more yeah. things to worry about than your MacGuffin. So yeah, uh, it, the important bit is that it turns out Iskandar has a very important place in Gamelon society. The Gamelons basically revere the the Iskandarians as basically like you know, not quite deities, but like space popes. Yeah, sort of like they are sort of like the they are sort of like the Space Pope, they're, they're sort of like the, they're the, they're the, they're the ancient empire that we adore and try to model ourselves after. Right. Yeah. Kinda. Um, 
And uh, you know, so and from there, you know, the Brahmins. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know, so you know, Melda, the admiral's daughter and fighter pilot, ends up on Yamato, and she ends up being, you know, you know, she and Yamato end up palling around together a lot. Uh, and there is totally a lot of. Uh, there is absolutely no sexual tension at all. The end. Yeah, no. none. What's there is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there, there's a couple of moments where, like, you, like, I literally, the first time I watched it, I was like, oh, just kiss already. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's clear the two of you have a thing for each other. It's just bloody obvious. I think that was actually one of my reactions was, and now they make out. And now they make out. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think, I think what I said was, I mean, considering they're both fighter pilots, this, was, this, this had more homoeroticism than Top Gun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except it was intentional. Uh, I think it was yeah. inten it was intentional, and it felt sort of it. It felt like it was just like it didn't feel like it was. It wasn't done for fan service, right? It well, wasn't. It, it was very surprisingly little fan service in the show. There is some because, it, of course, there, there is. is. Uh, yeah, all, I will admit, all, all the I say it was all the, all the females have some rather form fitting outfits. Yeah, well, yeah, virtually everybody wears fairly form fitting outfits for the most part. Mm. Spandex is a, uh, is the most used fabric in the twenty one ninety nine. Yeah, unless you're, unless you're Okita, basically. <laughs> yeah, I get a <laughs> or a Gamelon officer, except for Dommel. Dommel Do Dommel's outfit is pretty fucking form fitting. Yeah, he wears a lot of spandex. <clears throat> um, but uh, yeah, it, I, yeah, there's a requisite you know bath 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 scene but with Yamamoto and and uh, Mori talking in the baths. Uh. And there's a brief moment with Yamoto walking out of a shower. The chief nurse I is bath on that ship. <laughs> well, then what else are they gonna do with the water supply? It's a good way to store the water. It makes <laughs> what? They're gonna be recycling the water. It's a, they're gonna they're gonna have a huge tank of water. It makes perfect sense to have Lord. It, it, it actually makes a certain amount of sense if you think about it. They're, they might as well use it for other things too. But anyway, so yeah, you know, there's a bad scene. You know, there's a scene with you. You see Yamoto walking out of the shower and etc. Uh, they eventually there's there's a scene where they're all, where everybody goes swimming. So everyone's in bathing suits. Yep. Um. But for there's the most a, part, there the party where the nurse gets really drunk. Yes, the chief nurse is uh, <laughs> definitively the bustiest person in the show, <laughs> and she's also awesome. She <laughs> is. She's great. She's... And hilarious. Oh, we have to talk about the doctor. Oh, fucking Dr. Sato. <laughs> Dr. Sato <laughs> is... He is... He is the architect... So, you know, the general sort of... There's a general sort of uh, term for anime... Way anime character designs, which is big eyes, small mouth. There's also often a character in a lot of, a lot of early anime shows who's the exact opposite. Small eyes, giant mouth. Yeah. This is Dr. Sato. <laughs> He's this little rotund man with little beady eyes and a giant mouth and glasses and bald... And he it's, drinks it's, like a fish. It's the same head design as like a ninja turtle. Kinda, yeah. <laughs> it's a ball on top of a football. And he is fucking hilarious. And a brilliant doctor and a complete and utter alcoholic. <laughs> a completely functional alcoholic. I think he's drunk most of the time. Yeah. He even tries to get the robot to drink. Yes. <laughs> I'm a robot, therefore do not consume alcohol. Then what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> they are they're wonderful he's a wonderful character and he's a lot of fun yeah also uh so yeah so basically from there the series basically continue you know they they get to Skandar, they get the, they eventually get the device they go home they save the earth i think we need to sp uh spoiler warning because i want to talk about one thing. All right, so this is a we're about to talk about something a fairly major spoiler, I think. So, spoiler warning here, guys. If you don't want it, uh, something fairly major spoiled, pause now. Come back later, what have you? Or if yeah. you're not going to watch, if you're ever thinking about watching the show. All right, Eric, go. So, one of the things about the the Cosmo regeneration device that they have is it's actually impregnated with the the soul and personality algorithms of. Um, Kodai's big brother, because he ended up on Iskandar because magic. Um, uh, the, the, yeah, that actually is explained very well, unlike the original yes, series. I, I'm 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 glossing over it because magic. Right, it's not important to this point. 
But yeah, the important point is that there's a very important reason why they couldn't the, the Iskandarians couldn't just send the Cosmo DNA device to Earth. They needed to bring the Yamato there so they could build the device into the Yamato and basically use the sort of racial memory of the crew and you know and, and a bunch of other stuff to be the pattern to with which the device rebuilds the Earth. Yes. So uh, so they they use Kodai's big Kodai's big brother's personality as the core for this thing. Right. As the core programming. And um Mori earlier gets her ass shot by, uh, by Gamelon. And, and, and the, no, it's not, it's it's during the la- second to last episode she gets shot. Yeah. This is after she the coup's over. Full of a whole wicked lot of lead. This is um, during the trip home. Yes. Uh saving a another villain who ends up dead anyway. Um Yeah. Awesome. But we're not gonna talk about her right now. No. So Mori's got like massive organ failure they stick her in a, a big stasis tube they have to to try to keep her alive and um well she kicks it she dies uh, not everything they have going for them just isn't enough and she dies before Kodai, we get to that, hmm? i was about to say before we get to this point she's clearly dying and it's it's known that she's hurt yeah kodai is yeah this this at this point in the series he's realized that she is the love of his life they, they both have realized that they're going they're going to get married this is yes. like it's this is a given he is finally actually happy his life is back together and then she's shot and is going to die yeah and he proceeds to do this incredible job of basically putting on a brave front and basically make it look like that nothing is wrong yeah yeah he, he's Even while there's that, a fucking that, wedding that, going off on ship yeah he's got that sort of classic brittle smile the whole time Right, he's doing a really good job of basically, and he's like, he's, and, you know, Avatar is, uh, Okita is far too sick to basically doing a lot of stuff, so he's basically channeling Okita and basically saying, okay, look, he's basically trying to basically take the captain's place in that in the way that he did, right. sort of, you know, keeping people sort of, you know, focused and a focus on the task at hand, and, like, the crew's, and basically keeping everybody functioning, and he's doing a really good job of it. But, like, all his close friends are all like, oh, God, he's falling apart. Yeah, because yeah. it's obvious to anyone that knows him including the audience yeah so eventually Mori kicks it her, her injuries are too much all their tech just is enough to to keep the cascading organ failure from happening and um well he finally breaks kodai finally breaks with this news and just completely loses it his brother by the way has been haunting the ship as sort of a weird psychic projection Magic. <laughs> yeah. And his brother's personality, which has retains all the the memory from um before he died, goes, Wow, that's I was never really there for you, and this is this is terrible and it breaks my heart, so I'm gonna bring her back. I'm going to use the Cosmo Regeneration McGiggy to restore your love because that's the last thing I could do for you. And he does it. And she comes back to life and it's all used up. And all I can think is, fuck you, dude. You couldn't have waited six hours. Earth was in sight. You could see it out the porthole. Now, I will say this. I agree with you. <coughs> but. I mean, nice gesture and all, but you just doomed the human race. But he didn't. And I think he, the thing is, I think he knew he didn't. Yeah. I. You know what? Fuck. No, no. It, it's it's a great gesture and uh, and, uh, and and loving and what and all of that, but you know what, dude, you couldn't be certain that was what was going to happen. No, it's not. And no, you're you're right on that. But you have to factoring in Mas, Masamu's uh, personality. This is a this is you know he is impulsive. He is he's impulsive. He's emotional. He's, he's a gambler, um, and he's a gambler. Yes. Yeah. And so what he's, he does, so he's there gambling on the fact that he what he the, his his remaining conscious is gambling on the thing that even if he does this, he he knows Okita is there and he is the heart and soul of this ship, and the heart and soul of the ship is the whole point of the Cosmo DNA device. Yeah. And that okay, it, it will be Okita who saves the Earth. Yeah, which I think is great because I mean it brings. Not only uh, Kodai's arc around, because the entire thing is about, you know, his brother, you know, trying to do what's right by his brother's memory. 
and in the end, it's his brother's memory that basically says right by did, him. You, you did right by him. Sure, it makes and and at the same narrative sense. And at the same and, and, time, though, it gives it gives Akito uh, Akita, sorry, his his arc as well, because the 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 one driving thought that he's been through the entire series is he will get back to Earth before he dies. He will see Earth again. He will get back. That was his driving factor. Right, and, and he will save the Earth. And yeah. you're right. From a narrative point of view, it makes perfect sense. But <laughs> the, the the rational part of my brain right. screams in defiance at this act. This <laughs> selfish act. Yeah. I I, told, I actually completely agree with you on that point. I'm just saying that I I think that part of I I think it, it was as I said it, I think it was Masuma Kodai, Kodai's gambler side gambling on the, on this. That right. thinking... And it all makes sense narratively and from the point of view of those characters. That doesn't mean the logical part of my brain doesn't. I know. Isn't strangling the rest of my brain. <laughs> oh, believe me, the first the first time I saw it, I was livid. <laughs> but I've come to accept it basically. If you want to start logical, I mean, just just to, just to move it on a little bit, the one, and I hate to say problem, but the only niggle to me. And this is just because of me thinking logically and the way my brain works. Is okay. I get why the Yamoto, it, so the Yamoto, yeah. Hang on, what was Yamato. Yamato. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> where, was I, where was my head there? I don't, know. I don't know. The Yamato, sorry. I get why. Obviously, they built it based around an old battleship. I get why it fights in a naval style. Okay. Yeah. I get the cannons. I get all this sort of stuff. I get that. Why do the Gamelons? Um, reasons. Just fuck you. That's why. Because awesome. <laughs> the, the Gamelons. The, the Gamelons obey the same naval military yep, styles. They do. That Earth would. Apparently, the tech in the way tech goes in the the, the Yamato universe. That's just how space combat ends up actually working. Hmm. Because to the point they even have submarines. Yes. Well, here's the thing. Look at. Look at the morphology. Every intelligent race in the universe there are basically humans with different colored skin. They don't even have head ridges. Admittedly, though, if you look at the photos of Gamala, um, it's pretty much all land. Yeah, I I get the impression that it didn't. It that was from. There are hints and indications that it might not always have been that way. Yeah, just seems just, to have done a, a a fair job of industrializing yeah. everything. I, just, I, I and I also it's think sat a little bit funny that you know the the every ship in it, including the alien ships, were still these big lumbering cruisers with turret cannons. Yeah, I think part of that. I think part of the reason, at least from the Gamelon standpoint, is because of their fa their fixation with Iskandar, and Iskandar mm -hmm. is a water world. Yes, it is. I'll give, I'll give them that. So I'm not surprised. Like Iskandar, basically, you know, their all their naval stuff was probably because they they apparently had it and they ruled the galaxy for a while. You find out. And uh, they, I, I can totally understand why all the, they would have based a lot of their stuff on naval stuff. Yeah. So I can I, I can sort of see that, but I I from a purely logical standpoint, yeah, it makes no goddamn sense. <laughs> but it's I, awesome, I, so I don't care. I say, uh, well, yes, I mean at, at the same time, I all, I did enjoy the logic of the space battles from the Yamato's point of view because it's like okay, our beam weapons did fuck all against these things. We've got these uber beam cannons now that do damage. But why don't we bring some solid shells too? Just in case. Because they seem to do good too. Yep. And and seeing the impacts, the, the art in this is awesome. Oh god, to yeah. See, oh to yeah. See the impacts actually dent hull. They don't just go boom, explosion. No, you see the actual hull crumple and dent. Yeah. Oh my god. You get yeah. punched in. And, oh, the the animation is great in this series. It, it's gorgeous. Absolutely fucking gorgeous. I mean, um I, from the time period, because uh, it was from 2012, there are a couple of series with better animation, but that does not mean it's not top notch. Uh, it it's absolutely really good. It's fluid um, when it needs to be. The, it uses, and it's got excellent integration of CG and cell animation. It does its job. It yeah. knows what it's doing, and it does it well. And the, I mean, it's not, and it's not just the how well it's animated. It's how well everything's drawn too. Yeah, it's yes. the detail that they go into. It's not just that it's pretty, but they, they take the, the time to go into the detail of the scene as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There are lots it's of little things that, lots of little things that happen. It's not flash, flash, frame. Right. There's like <laughs> lots of little details in the background that if you're paying attention, you're like, oh, that's really cool. 
Like, there's a bit where the, the Gamelons have a space sub. Just accept they have a space sub and roll with it. Um, and, like, there's during the big fleet battle with with D Dommel, the sub is, as we mentioned, the sub is is behind the kidnapping of Mori. And as, as, as like, during that battle, as you sort of, as you watch it, like, as things are going on, like, the ship... The you see the sub sinking as it, it releases it the little thing to go board the, the modern capture the thing, and like you, it, the scene is completely focused on the boarding ship coming in, and in the background you see the sub sort of slowly descend back into subspace. Yep. Yeah. And it's one of those details that in a lot of shows they probably wouldn't have bothered having it there, but no, Yamato has every time like, whenever they have a chance to have something like that in the background to make it feel more natural. Like if you if this is what would actually happen, they generally do that. Well, one of the things I noticed about uh, Yamato also is that they animate a lot of like s small changes in facial expression. Yes, um, which uh, a lot of shows won't do, and you can always tell that a studio loves the project when they do that. Yes, yeah. I mean, and, you can, you and, can and, like, tell little, that... like like changes in like the, the the way the eye sits and how the corner of the mouth sits and all that stuff, and no one's ever off model. Everyone's exactly the way they're supposed to look at look like throughout the entire thing, and it's yeah. Like I said, they're very good at animating people's body language and yeah. little tiny little facial tics. The, it's the how, impression... how both the audience and Koda's friends know he's breaking at the end. Yeah, you get the impression that um, the studio responsible for this, the you know the air date, was more of a case of it's ready when it's ready. Oh yes. yeah, no, that's actually the case. Uh, yeah. Apparently they like it was like for a lot of people it's like uh, they released like ten episodes and there was like a several month break before they the next chunk of episodes came out. Yep. Yeah, from what I was reading, they actually released it in the cinema. Yeah. So you could go yeah. to the cinema, watch ten episodes of Yamato, and then uh, see you in six months. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's movie quality for a lot of it. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. You know, like all the micro expressions on Des Desler's face. Yes. Are just like yes, because he's he, an excellent example um, uh, uh, about how well they animated facial expressions. It's like you can see, it's like the, as we we're talking about, like you can see Deslock getting Desler getting irritated with with Dommel. His face doesn't change that much, but there's little yeah. like little tweaks to his eyes and his mouth every now and then. It's like he's like in standard anime, you, what what will happen is their eyes will get hooded, their face might fault. Right, right. That's how you can tell somebody's bored. In this, no, you're looking at a guy, and you can tell <laughs> by looking at his face, he's bored. Yeah, like this little the way his mouth changes slightly, the way the sort of corner of his eyes twitch, the way he's, it's like oh god, the way he slumps his shoulders very slightly. Yep, and, and like I said, that's all done to the nines in Yamato. Yeah, and it, yeah, there aren't a lot of shows that will go go the extra mile. I can only think of like maybe a four off the top of my head, and Yamato does it. It's great. Right. So yeah, um. We've been going for a long while now, and I think we probably we could talk, probably talk Jeez, a bit longer. This is like a double episode here. Yeah, but uh, I think we should wrap. Well, we had the intro also, so that that yeah. extended a bit. But I think we'll wrap things up here. Uh, so before we go, I want to get into our sort of final recommendations on on Yamato twenty one ninety nine. Um, I'll go last. Eric, why don't you start? Go watch it. Why aren't you watching it now? Go. Just just do it. Don't listen to the end of the show. Go watch Yamato twenty ninety nine. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Gap. Yeah, I mean, like I say, I'm I'm the one that's came come into this. I don't know if Eric had seen this before, but I I was the one coming into this. I'd never even heard it. Well, I've heard it in passing of Yamato, um, but I I loved it. I I really enjoy watching it, and I probably will watch it again sometime in the future. Yeah, you, you I think you heard of it. And it heard me talking about it endlessly, probably. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I I think it's a it's a round series of thumbs up. We all love this show. Um, as I said, as I said at the start of the show, this is my favorite anime series. Yeah. Uh, and I cannot recommend this show highly enough. If you like sci-fi space, if you like sci-fi space opera, you're gonna love the show. It's it's just really good. Uh, it's beautiful. It's well animated. The story is great. It's epic. There's great characters. There's character development. There's a great villain. There are antagonists who are not completely villainous. Plus, if you even if you don't like sci-fi as such, if you've ever sat down with your granddad on a you know on a Sunday afternoon and watched one of those old naval films, and you like yeah. that, you will love this. Yeah, this yeah, is this absolutely. is not only a sci-fi. This is a naval film that just happens to be in space. Yeah, and it's just. And they take the time to explain a lot of the stuff that, like, you think is like, oh, that's going to be a plot hole. No, it turns out it's not. <laughs> there are a few minor plot things here and there, which I think are there mostly so they can do the next season. Uh, 
Yeah, and um, no, it's a it's a very tightly plotted show. Yeah, I will it, say it, very few leaks in it. I will say it is hard to find. If you yeah, sorry, it, specifically, it's, it's, I should yeah, say it's it's hard to find legitimately. Yeah, uh, you can I don't buy. Think it's available for legal streaming in the states. It at is all. not. Uh, it's not on Crunchyroll. Uh, it's not anywhere. Uh, you can buy the DVDs off eBay, and they are monstrously expensive because they're imported from Japan. Yeah. And Japan DVDs aren't cheap. No, and it's like four episodes per disc, so... Yeah. Yeah, the, the prices they charge for those uh, DVDs is the reason Gundam doesn't get shown in, in, in outside, outside Japan very often. So, <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to go through... You're going to have to go through, go through and find it. But, yeah, we, we... But it's worth the effort to find it. Honestly, we'd give you the site that we watched it, but like we said, legal streaming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're not gonna we're, we won't we won't talk about that. But so I, I think we all can agree that this is a phenomenal series and is completely worth watching. Yeah. It's, it may have you. It may not hit if you. I, I honestly feel that basically anybody can watch it and enjoy it. If you like sci-fi, if you like space opera, if you like naval stuff, you will love it. I may even I may even say. Beasts. I may even say that if you if you're one of these that likes that it's like you can't really get into like sci uh, anime of the seventies because oh it looks old I don't like that style it's it looks you know it's old but you want to see where it all started yes yeah yeah absolutely you, use this the anim the animation doesn't get much better at this point and it it's all the original like I say that it's full of tropes because it started them yeah yeah. Uh, one last note about Yam the original Yamato, which I want to mention, uh, and part of the reason it it it, it was so influential. Um, the it, it when it came out in seventy four, um, it actually won it won awards. Um, it's specifically I'm trying to find the name of the the show the the award. Ah, uh, crap. Uh, there we go. It was the first anime series or movie to ever win the Seiyun Award. Which is the Japanese equivalent of the Hugos for science fiction, mm. Mm. Uh, and this was feat was not repeated until 1984 when Nausicaa Valley of the Wind won it. Yeah, it, it Yamato is the original Yamato is one of the most influential anime series ever, and Yamato 2199 is a perfect homage to it. It, it absolutely it does it it is a perfect adaptation of the original series. It it. In general, I'm not a big fan of the whole sort of like retelling of like classic series. A lot of them they, they don't get. They don't quite they they make too many changes in the wrong ways, in my personal opinion. They're, I'm but that's me. It's that said, for, it's a remake for profit, like what Hollywood's doing right now. Right. In this case, it is a it was a it was very clearly a project of admiration and love and bringing the story to a new generation and mm. doing it right so that the story. Is it's still the same story, just done in a way that looks more modern? Yeah. And they did it perfectly, in my opinion. So that's going to do it for this time. Uh, thank you, thank you everybody for 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 giving us a listen. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you, I hope you, if you haven't seen Yamato Twenty One Ninety Nine, that you go out and find it. It's it's great. It's definitely worth watching. I haven't done it already. Yeah. yeah. Um. Next time when we record this, uh, I don't know when it'll be exactly, uh, but we've already watched the show, so we're going to... It probably won't be... It might not be too long from now. We're going to be talking about One Punch Man. Oh, good oh, God, yes. Uh, so, <laughs> you'll hear our thoughts on One Punch Man. Uh, and uh, hope you hope you enjoy it. Uh, thank you guys for what. Thank you for everybody for listening. I hope you had fun, and we'll see you guys uh, next time we do the show. Bye. Oh, before I forget, this was recorded on hitbox.tv slash mecha-gm. Um, uh, my host, as always, uh, my host, my, my co-host, Eric Carlson, Hello. and and uh, Sonic Gav. Hello. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at mecha-gm. Gav is at Sonic Gav. Eric is not on the internet. I don't believe in the internet. It's not real. Of, excuse me, I'm going to go watch shows on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody.